thank you very much for your your kind uh, words and also about Gödel uh, here at the Institute where he spent most of his life um, in America there's now Gödel, Gödel Lane so there's von Neumann Lane and there's Weil Lane and Panofsky Lane the famous art historian who was here and now added to all these luminaries is a street uh, sign. I didn't have time to take a picture of it and include it here, but it, it means you've really arrived if you have a street named after you at the Institute for Advanced Studies. <laughs> okay, so the background of this paper is that um, I was invited by Diane Proudfoot, who's someone I respect greatly, um, to contribute to a volume on, on computability. Uh, I'm not a computability theorist at all. It's a very deep area. I have written about Gödel's role in the history of computability of the 30s. Um, I've written maybe four or five or six papers, you know, basically, you know, saying all of them the same thing with various different degrees of emphases. So there's a paper called Turing, Gödel, and the Bright Abyss that more or less has, has everything. Okay, so um, how do I advance? Yeah, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read, um, do you see on the screen yourselves? The, the column of uh, participants? Yes, but uh, it is okay. you could make it disappear if you want to make it disappear. Yeah, so I will just, I will just, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so I'm going to, um, to actually read a paper. It's something I never do. I always speak extemporaneously for, for better or for worse. <laughs> but um, there's a rather careful argument uh, here. So I'm going to read a paper and at the same time, I'm going to be, going to be, um, showing you these slides. So I hope it all, it, I hope it all is reasonably syn synchronized. Uh, okay, so I'll start with, um, I'll start with my abstract. So in, in 1936, Church coined the phrase Turing machine to describe Turing's mathematical model. And in doing so, he enabled one of the oldest and most powerful metaphors ever to enter the sciences, the machine metaphor. So Turing called them logical computing machines or LCMs, uh, uh, church called them, called them uh, Turing machines. Um, so 1936 was a very, very important year for, for, for computability. De debates among Gödel, church and others over the correct analysis of the intuitive concept, human effectively computable. So that's what they, they called it. Uh, this analysis was at the heart of the incompleteness theorems, the Entscheidungsproblem, the question of what is a finite computation, and urgently for Gödel, the question of the generality of the incompleteness theorems, a question that lingered um, until, uh, or, you know, from 1931 through 1936, to what formal systems do those theorems apply? Now, if you recognize the title of Gödel's paper, it's, it refers to related systems but what related system? Okay, so all, all of this was definitively set to rest with the appearance of the Turing machine. Uh, Gödel especially was, was emphatically con convinced by the adequacy of Turing's model. And by the adequacy uh, or the adequacy problem, I mean the, the, the problem of uh, faithfully capturing the intuitive notion of computability what a person uh, can, can, can compute. Um, so he had, uh, so there, the period 1931 to 1936, many different systems emerged. None of them uh, prior to Turing's model was judged to be adequate by Gödel, even his own system, the class of Herbron Gödel recursive, recursive functions. And I think this feeling was widespread um, at the time. So uh, the mathematical facts are known. The principles have written about uh, that history. I mean, people like um, Rosser, uh, uh, Church, um, uh, you know, many have, have written histories of, of the period. Uh, uh, Searle has written, uh, uh, sorry, not Searle, Soar, Robert Soar. Uh, has written some beautiful histories, not to mention, of course, Martin Davis, uh, Wilfred C. So, so we know the mathematical, the math mathematical facts, but 
The question I want to um, explore here is, uh, do the mathematical thoughts, uh, mathematical facts really exhaust what there is to be said about the thinking of the so-called confluence of ideas in 1936? This is Gandhi's um, the phrase for uh, um, the events of 1936 that I will, I will describe. His paper is called The Confluence of Ideas. In 1936, to me, it's one of the most beautiful papers on any in foundations full stop, but certainly in the, uh, this area of, of computability. Okay, so is there more, is there something to be said and from the direction of cultural influence? So the Gödel's assimilation of Turing's work occurred during a period of high modernism and within modernism, a high point of technological optimism and what Carolyn Jones in her book called The Machine in the Studio, whoops, how do I? Yeah, um, machine in the studio refers to as the technological sublime. So I will tell you what, what she means by the technological sublime. And indeed, uh, there are some very tantalizing parallels between what happened in the foundations of mathematics of the period and developments uh, within modernist culture of the first half of the 20th century, a culture whose icon if it could be thought of ha having one is surely the machine. So I'll argue for a cultural role in Gödel's and by extension, the larger logical community's absorption of Turing's 1936 model. Uh, the distinction I'm going to make use of is one that Jones lays out in her book between the iconic and the performative aspects of the technological sublime a distinction operating within late modernist art, according to Jones, but serving the history of computability equally well. So what, I'm, what I want to say is that the iconic and the performative modes within this concept of the technological sublime operate not only within art, they're also threaded into logic. So uh, this raises immediately the problem of influence. Right? The, the, the problem of whether it really exists or not between art and, and, and mathematics. And here I'm interested in, in the writings of the modernist critic Clement Greenberg, for whom influence, if not even convergence, was, was a given. So here uh, from his uh, essay called Modernism, he's talking about the profound degree to which modernist art belongs to the same specific cultural tendency as modern science. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about his, uh, his uh, what he means by this uh, shared cultural uh, tendency. Now, this, this issue, as, as Anna said, is, is a very difficult one. I mean, people have talked about parallelism um, in, in um, for example, cubism is often brought up in, in these kind of in, informal discussions around the incompleteness theorems and, and so on. So incompleteness being responsible for inaugurating mathematics' own kind of modernism, if you like, marked by the uh, splitting of mathematical truth from mathematical proof and by the rise of formalism, nominalism, and other anti-realist and relativist ideologies. A modernism that is still with us, so the modernism within foundations um, is still with us, arguably, unlike the case of modernism in art, which is thought to have come to an end, at least in America, sometime in the 60s. And this is, I mean, it's interesting when you have different fields, they have their own set of problems um, sort of um, holy grail problems, if you like. And in art history, the problem of why did modernism end? That's a, that's a much discussed problem, uh, problem for, for them. So it's, it's difficult to speak of the influence of culture on, on the sciences. There's, there seems to be very little in the way of language um, for this kind of, kind of criticism. And I have to mention Andy here, I think in the development of this kind of criticism, uh, Andy has really been, been a pioneer. Um, so the thought is, uh, so, so without that kind of uh, uh, language, I think the view is that mathematics is somehow sealed off from culture, immune to influence, answerable to no force of human culture beyond its own internal imperatives. 
So that's the view. Uh, another view, uh, another way of looking at it would be to say that mathematics is, is porous. So uh, alive and reactive to shifts in the larger culture if it's not even in a state of symbiosis with culture. So this is the thought that mathematics and art can harmonize at times being subject to the same forces of human history, or as Greenberg puts it, being part of the same specific cultural tendency and reciproc uh, reciprocally. So we have to say, along with the idea that art and mathematics are subject to the same forces of history, one might also say they, they're themselves forces of history. They displace and disrupt and even constitute history itself. The theory of computability in the 30s involves several key figures, but I'm concerned here with Gödel's part in this history. Gödel was moved by Turing's model. One could almost say that he was startled by it. And this startling is what I want to make strange in this talk, in this paper. There was nothing inevitable about Gödel's embrace of Turing's, Turing's model. If this is, a, this is an individual person um, uh, existing in the modernist era who uh, uh, has, has made um, a kind of dr dramatic turnaround on issues uh, very, very fundamental to, to logic and, and philosophy of mathematics, just on the occasion of the occurrence of Turing's, Turing's model. So what, what happened? What happened there? So I'm, I'm going to argue that it was, it was produced within a subjectivity constituted by, by the modern. For it's modernism that is at issue here, a modernism indexed to the machine and aiming at genre purity, a modernism that transformed both mathematics and art into self-directed, self-critical practices. The aspiration in both cases is autonomy. For art, autonomy in the Greenbergian sense, which I will talk about, taking the firm form of medium specificity, and for mathematics, philosophical autonomy, taking the form of a hoped for internal consistency proof, just for one example of, of um, how one may read that phrase, itself a form of medium specificity. Okay, so um, I, I don't know how I'm doing on, on time. Maybe give me a high sign when I have 10 minutes to go, Anne or Andy. Uh, I, I'm going to make a few remarks on metaphor, then, so the outline of this talk, I'm, I'm going to talk about metaphor, I'm then going to talk about the general history of computability in the 1930s, confining myself to the single episode within this history, Gödel's confrontation with Turing's model by way of the machine metaphor. It was a metaphor that drew its power, I will suggest, from the technological optimism of the time. If the language of optimism does not fall too far short of the sweeping embrace of the machine rampant in all quarters of the period, an embrace we see indicated, at least in America, already decades before, thinking of, for example, Walt Whitman's 1869 poem, uh, including the line, singing the strong light works of engineers, his poem of 1869, written after the opening of the Suez Canal. So there you have, a prime example of technological optimism. Simply put, this is the story of how the vocabulary of the machine entered Gödel's logical vocabulary and consequently the vocabulary of logic, the story of how that vocabulary swept away the many obscurities that had clouded the discussion around com computability prior to 1936, the story of how that vocabulary resolved one by one the problems of what is a finite computation how general are the incompleteness theorems, how to define the concept of formal system, that is the problem of delimiting and persistifying those, those, those concepts. So let's just think about, let's just think about this notion of, of formal, formal system or formalism. Uh, I think this is a kind of neglected area of uh, Gödel studies. He was really um, unsure of, uh, of, of, of what, uh, of the meaning of, of that, of that concept up until, up until um, the emergence of the Turing machine. And when you think about it, I mean, just as with computability, uh, notion of continuity, right? We have pathological examples, 
I mean, that's a strong word, but things like the space filling curves and so on, they're continuous and they're just, you know, uh, um, you know, they, they, they fill every point of the space in the unit box. Um, does the notion of formal system admit pathological examples? Okay, so after going through the history very briefly of uh, computability in, in the 30s, I'll turn to Greenberg's modernism, his account of how the goal of auton autonomy and genre purity were attained as natural developments within late modernist art. So I have a section on metaphor, but um, I, I don't think I will uh, go through it. I'm just walking here to <laughs> get, get my clock so I can keep keep track of. I just finished teaching my class in Helsinki, so it's not as organized as I would I would like. So um, there's a lot to say about uh, the connection between metaphor and, and knowledge, um, about the power a metaphor has to penetrate a science like mathematics and to act forcefully on it. Um, so here's here's a quote from from Rorty. Rorty has written beautifully about about uh, metaphor. He talks about Aristotle's use of usia, Saint Paul's metaphorical use of agape, Newton gravitas. Uh, he talks about, you know, how they could have possibly cut cosmic rays scrambling the fine structure of some neurons in their brains. Uh, it hardly matters how the trick was done. The results were marvelous. There had never been such things before. So um, to add some ma mathematical metaphors to the list, collapsing cardinals, continuous function, interior, exterior. So mathematics is certainly metaphor metaphor is saturated. And indeed, you can hardly imagine, one can hardly imagine mathematics without uh, metaphor. So just to talk for a moment about Rorty's account, his very elaborate account of metaphor and the way metaphor operates in, in, in language. So the idea is that uh, these are private acts of redescription originating outside of language, um, outside in the sense of, of unintelligibility that is being being um, in the sense of, of being nonsense. And his account turns on the idea of the literalized metaphor. So literalization being what happens when a metaphor breaks into sensibility, when a phrase like, for example, point of view comes to mean something like an attitude towards something. So this, this, this is to say that a point of view has become literalized. It's entered public discourse. And here's a quote uh, by him, this idea of uh, this line we cross between noise and a place and a pattern of, of justification or belief. And many people have, have talked about live and, and dead, um, dead metaphors. For Rorty, um, these are, these are uh, calls. This is the way that, um, a human society generates new meaning for itself. They are calls to um, change your language and, and your life. They're evidence of the ability of a social practice to, um, to continually tra transform itself. So for Rorty, metaphor is really, um, really very, very, very important. And, and uh, he uses this phrase, the fuel of metaphors are the fuel of liberalism. Uh, Robert Frost, interesting, the poet, um, called metaphor all of thinking. So he's an interesting fellow, fellow traveler here. So in this uh, Amherst College address in 1931, he says, without metaphor, we are not safe in our science. We are not safe in in history. R Ricoeur, of course, has written eloquently on metaphor and even Quine recognized the importance of metaphor for, for science and, and philosophy. Uh, so my concern here is with the machine metaphor, which is very old, uh, going back to the classical period and returning in renewed forms ever since. In the 17th century, Descartes famously assimilated the body to a machine in the discourse on method. And in the 20th century, the Italian futurist, really deplorable machine rhetoric. So 
um, Marinetti and the manifesto, futurist manifesto, he, and in his letters, and he, he talks about war as something to be enjoyed as a grand theater of the machine and so on. This gives rise to a new artistic genre, the genre of futurism. So this is uh, assimilating the body to, to, to a machine. Oh, here's the coin quote, if anyone is interested. Um, and reciprocally, so there, there are reciprocal metaphors in play here. So to speak of the machine as a body or as possessing a body or as having bodily agency, this is now more than a way of speaking. This has colonized vast areas of, of society uh, well beyond fields like philosophy of mind with the human mind being like the site of software and so on. The discussion is the mind deterring machine and so on. Uh, so there's, there's, of course, a lot to say about this, and a lot of ink has been spilled on this. However, it's Gödel's use of the machine metaphor, the way he used the metaphor within logic, which I want to I want to talk about. So uh, the language of the machine enters Gödel's logical vocabulary in the first sentence of his 1931 paper on the incompleteness theorems. He was among the first to suggest the problem of isolating the concept that is beginning with a pre-theoretic intuitive concept of computability and ending with a formal mathematical modeling thereof. As Gödel would realize almost immediately upon proving the, the incompleteness here and the question of their generality, that is the question to which those formal systems, uh, which formal systems those theorems apply was left unresolved in the 31 paper. And this is because the generality issue is tied to the availability of a precise and adequate notion of effective computability and or if you like finite procedure. Now, uh, intuitive computability or effective computability, finite procedure, these are of course different notions. Gödel uses them as synonyms at, at times. Um, so, um, uh, you need, in, or, in other words, in order to underwrite the generality of the incompleteness theorems, you need a notion, a sharp notion of, of computability. You need an adequate modeling of the notion of computability. This is because the formal systems that are at issue with the incompleteness theorems are to be given uh, effectively. And if you notice in the 1931 paper, Gödel stopped short of claiming complete generality for them, um, writing that it's conceivable that there are finitary systems that are not covered by those, those theorems. In correspondence with Herbrand later, Gödel, let me see if I have this quote. Oh, yeah. Uh, Gödel even goes on to say that the concept of finite computation um, was itself undefinable, uh, a view he held through 1934 and beyond when he wrote that the notion of finite computation is not defined, but serves as a heuristic uh, principle. And here's his letter uh, to Herbrand. I think there are only two, two letters in which he says, a finite test proof formalizable in, in Principia would have to be quite, uh, sorry, not formalizable. So a finite test proof that falls outside of the system of Principia would have to be very complicated. And so probably we're not going to be able to find one, but that does not alter anything about the possibility of finding one in, in principle. Um, of course, the period saw other, other developments. So in the 34 lectures, Gödel presents the Herr von Gödel recursive functions. There are of course many other developments Church's development of the lambda calculus together with Kleene, uh, the systems from the 1920s due to Emil Post, the Post systems. Um, so you had in the 30s all these different uh, persistifications of the notion of computability. They all are, can, can be easily shown to be equivalent. Um, that is to say, they identify the same class, class of functions, but none of them is satisfactory as an adequate modeling of, of the intuitive notion. And there's a famous uh, letter of, of, of Church, I think, to, uh, to Kleene when he suggests to Gödel 
to equate human computability, or you know, this word effective refers to human, with lambda definability, Gödel finds this thoroughly unsatisfactory. Okay, um, so the word mechanical, again, in the 1934 lectures, this again modifies rules. So this falls well short of his later view, which identifies the whole formal system as a machine outright in 1936. So this is the this is the post touring development that I that I want to talk about. So up until 1936, uh, it's the rules that are somehow thought to be machine like, or this is what is this is what is written. After 1936, the entire deductive apparatus is likened to to a machine. Now it's it's worth mentioning that a machine or protocol like notion of a formal system would have been known. Uh, to Tarski. So this is apparently Hodges has written, and I can give you the reference, um, just on the basis of the Polish terminology that uh, deductive theory would have been thought of by somebody like, like Tarski as something to be performed. Um, so as Hodges puts it, Tar Tarski's view was that a deductive theory is a kind of activity. So here you see we're getting closer to, to this idea of a deductive theory as a machine. Um, so, uh, 19, uh, Gödel's later 1965 letter to, to Kreisel, uh, again, uh, talking about the generality issue. This begins to be plausible, uh, in 1935, but I was completely convinced only by Turing's, um, uh, model. So in 1936, as we all know, Turing gave a self-standing analysis of informal human effective computability and used it to solve the Entscheidung's problem as, as Church had solved it just prior, though with a conceptually different proof. Turing's analysis was exact but informal, defining the concept of human effectively computable by means of an apparatus, quote unquote, consisting of a tape scanned by a reader, with a set of simple instructions adjoined. So the analysis, analysis consists of first, a conceptual analysis of human effective computation, and second, a mathematical modeling of the concept consisting of rules given by a set of, of quintuples. That is the machine is a set of, of quintuples. It's, it's a mathematical object. It's not a, physical, not a physical object. And in fact, you would not want to build a machine as it turns out. Turing's construction was homemade, homespun, and eminently workable, and the reaction to it among Princeton logicians was explosively positive. As Cleany would write in 1981, let me see if I have this on the slide, Turing's computability is intrinsically persuasive, but lambda definability is not, and general recursiveness, scarcely so, if Charles Gödel at the time being um, not at all pers persuaded. Um, <clears throat> a postscript that Gödel appends to the, so let's just take a look at Gödel's, uh, Gödel's response. There are also contemporary uh, references, but he wrote uh, later on. By the way, he talks to, to Hao Wang, this is uh, about this idea that it, it uh, in terms, in the context of his so-called conversion to phenomenology, that um, the Turing analysis of uh, computability was really the only fully worked out um, phenomenological analysis. But here's what he says um, as a postscript to the 19, to the reprinting of his 1934 uh, lectures. Uh, he says, now a precise and unquestionably adequate definition of the general concept of formal system can now be given. And uh, the uh, uh, incompleteness theorems can now be seen uh, as being proved rigorously for every consistent formal system containing a certain amount of number theory. So this is an astonishing, astonishing statement that things he had been worried about for five years, the generality issue and the question of a formal system, this is now solved in, in, in one, in one uh, blow. So let's read the rest of it. Turing's work gives an analysis of the concept of mechanical procedure. This concept is shown to be equivalent with that of a Turing machine. 
A formal system can simply be deemed to be any mechanical procedure for producing formulas called provable formulas and so on. Uh, uh, this is provided that the term finite procedure is understood to mean mechanical procedure. This meaning, however, is required by the concept of formal system whose essence it is that reasoning can be completely replaced by mechanical operations. And now here again, um, a similar postscript appears if you look in the Oxford Collected Works, uh, there's a note added. Oh, sorry, this is not the Oxford. This is again Davis uh, to the republication of his 31 paper. And he, he again talks about the generality uh, issue. So there you see the phrase every, every formal system. Okay, and there's a footnote there uh, here, general notion of formal system. What do we mean by that? He says, in my opinion, the term formal system or formalism should never be used for anything but, uh, but this, this notion. Gödel would later say to Hao Wang uh, for his, uh, the, the, the discussion between Gödel and Hao Wang on computability is mainly in From Mathematics to Philosophy, the very first volume of uh, books that, that Wang wrote. And uh, here he talks, he, he makes again, this very, very strong statement. It's absolutely impossible that anyone who understands the question that is, or the problem, find an adequate modeling of the intuitive, of intuitive computability and knows Turing's definition should decide for a different concept. So for Gödel, the Turing machine was not just another in the list of acceptable notions of of computability, it was in some sense the grounding of, of all of them. Um, so in some sense, uh, uh, and, and here I'm, I'm, I'm quoting myself from my abyss paper, that the Turing machine was as seamless a fit of the raw and the cooked as ever there was in mathematics. For computability, the Turing machine was the beating, the beating heart. And this is where most um, this is where most um, accounts of uh, the story, at least insofar as Gödel is involved in it, he starts working on set theory in 1934. He comes up with the consistency of the CH, the continuum hypothesis, in 1937. Um, but he 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 does kind of depart depart the area. Uh, he will make, of course remarks about this issue of whether the mind is a Turing machine and so on, but he, he will not work in computability per se again. So um, as I said, I've, I've written a lot about this episode and I realized the reason I was writing about it so much was that there was something kind of disturbing about it in the sense that um, if you consider the arc of Gödel's thought as, as a whole, this, this abrupt change of mind on so many issues fundamental to logic and to his own work in logic is drastically out of character. Right? We see all these books and this reference with titles like Gödel, Conviction and Caution and so on. He was, he was thought of as a very person of, of, of great caution in, intellectually. Uh, so uh, I realized that, I mean, being asked to write a last paper <laughs> on computability, and I think it will be my last paper, this one, um, I, I wanted to, to think about this, this uh, episode in, in, in Gödel's um, logical life and in, 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 in the history of computability in, in the 30s and sort of think about what might have been behind uh, this um, this drastic drastic change change of mind. So the one thing you notice when you read these these remarks is this word mechanical, this uh, machine, uh, this word machine for proving this phrase machine for proving theorems and so on. So in some sense, the machine metaphor here is doing a, a tremendous amount of work. Um, and this is a metaphor embedded in the cultural context of high modernism and high technological optimism, a metaphor if taken in the sense of the Turing machine, tied to step-by-stepness, homespun protocols, 
to the almost what you might call the mathematical pastoral image of children sitting at their desks in musty rooms in pre-war England, worrying over their sums, a metaphor, I think, tied inexorably to the technological sublime. So now let's, um, let's think about uh, uh, modernism, autonomy, self-critique, and the technological sublime. So modernism is a very, very big uh, topic. It's a, it's a multi-dimensional Weltanschauung sweeping across the creative domains of the late 19th and 20th century, a Weltanschauung indexed, as I've said, to the machine. Modernism in art is often identified with the collapse of realism and the rise of abstraction in the early part of the 20th century, something we take very much for granted right now, and the emergence of a certain kind of rhetoric about the end of painting, as Malievich put it. In modern literature, modernist literature, um, you have the rejection of entrenched forms of, 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 of expression in favor of what Gertrude Stein put. Uh, she, she talked about experiential vereticality and uh, so on. Um, so the canon of modernist critique is, is immense. Um, here I'm interested in the trajectory within modernism involving, as I've been saying, the technological sublime, the impact of the specific cultural tendency in Greenberg's language along the iconic performative axis on the theory of computability in the 30s. So let's look at, um, uh, sorry, uh, so here's the critic. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about autonomy in art. This was a term of, of Greenberg and of, of critics around him. So here um, is from his uh, uh, essay on modernism. The essence of modernism lies, as I see it, in the use of characteristic methods of a discipline to criticize the discipline itself, not in order to subvert it, but in order to entrench it more firmly in its area of competence. Kant used logic to establish the limits of logic. And while he withdrew much from its old jurisdiction, logic was left all the more secure in what there remained to it. And for somebody who works in foundations of mathematics and who knows about the Hilbert program and so on, this is as precise a description as you can find of the self-critical methodological strategies of the foundational programs of the early part of the 20th century in Vienna, Göttingen, Cambridge, and, and elsewhere. As we know, the Hilbert program develops exact methods whereby the notion of proof itself becomes an, an object of mathematical study. Mathematics, by, by means of these programs, turns the camera, right, which is in mathematics often directed outwards, turns the entire machinery of mathematics onto itself in order to set mathematics more firmly in its foundations, or as Greenberg put it, to entrench it more firmly in its area of uh, competence. So um, uh, uh, autonomy uh, for Greenberg comes from the sciences. I don't have a quote here, unfortunately, but I will read it to you. He says, uh, he talks about purity, and this is something that, that Andy, of course, has, has worked in scientific, uh, has contributed to the discussion around purity of very deep papers. So Greenberg says this about purity, scientific method alone asks or might ask that a situation be resolved in exactly the same terms as that in which it is presented. Okay, so what does autonomy in painting look like? Well, this, according to Greenberg, seeps into painting in the, in the 1940s, in the late modernist era. And the idea was that the artwork was to reach the viewer through eyesight alone. And this is the title of an earlier book of, of Jones on, on Greenberg. Trans the idea was to transform the viewer into a purely optical subject. So this phrase, the optical uh, subject. Uh, flatness and frontality are key words here, and where Mondrian is criticized for creating form scenarios, so Greenberg sees this as a kind of uh, story about form, right, instead of actually conveying form, form itself. Uh, someone like Pollock, uh, someone like Pollock achieves a dissolution of the picture into sheer 
texture. Now this is uh, this is Rothko, but uh, Pollock also. I couldn't find a, a, a beautiful enough um, reproduction of Pollock's uh, work. So um, entering the body through eyesight alone. So this is autonomy in 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 painting. The idea that um, I mean, whereas in the 19th century, we look at a painting of Monet of, you know, some, some ocean scene or something like that. And it reminds us perhaps of our previous, all that um, the, the viewer is a, is a viewer drawing on their memory, drawing on concepts having to do with, um, you know, their uh, physical appearance of heat and water and so on. Here, the idea is to transform the viewer into a purely optical, optical uh, subject. Uh, for autonomy and mathematics, so this is more or less at the same time. Uh, so this is Curtis Franks, who, you know, albeit has a perhaps slightly contested view of the Hilbert program, but I, 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 I think it's a very important read. So uh, for Franks. Hilbert's chief aim is to establish a mathematical autonomy according to which the reliability of ordinary mathematics does not rest on any epistemological background nor any philosophically informed frame, framework, framework since these can only provide uh, ambiguous foundation. So this is Curtis Franks, I think it's called the, the autonomy of, of mathematics. So the idea is that mathematics is supposed to, when it comes to the foundational issue of providing things like an internal consistency proof and so on, it has to do for itself. Okay. Uh, and I think it's very interesting in art, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll try to wind things up quickly, um, that uh, you have this distinction also, you know, Platonizing and naive, so this is Greenberg on, on Mondrian, uh, calls him Platonizing and naive, guilty of uh, having attempted to elevate as the goal of the total historical development of art what is only a time, you know, a style that has become ex exhausted. Okay, um, I have written a paper about uh, the end of modernism and the um, what what one might call the eruption of language into the aesthetic field. So this is one view of the end of modernism that you have language and syntax uh, pouring pouring uh, into it. Um, so I want to finally end then, but that is a that, that's I think I'm out of time, so I won't talk talk about that. So I want to finally turn to the technological sublime. This is a term from the mid-century critic Leo March, his book called The Machine in the Garden. And this uh, technological sublime holds the romantic or sublime conception of the American landscape of the late, late 19th century, seeing that terrain as a kind of virginal paradise up against the language of internal progress. So the book is called The Machine in the Garden, and this is meant to mark the conflict between technology and pastoralism, the conflict conflict, Marx has his own uh, story that it's, it's, it's masking the real problems of industrial civilization. So he calls this complex hybrid of the technological progressivism and the pastoral ideal, the rhetoric of the te technological sublime. And he positions it in mid 19th century America. Jones uses it to talk about uh, the machine in the studio and the art of the 19th 60s, and for her, the technological sublime is characterized by the appearance of moonshots, superhighways, and so on, existing side by side with a growing ecology uh, movement. And um, so this is where I guess I should end, right? Soon? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just take take a few minutes for so I wanted to adapt this notion of the technological sublime and the iconic and performative modes uh, uh, within it to um, appropriate it as a possible explanation of Gödel's um, uh, 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 change of mind, his uh, recognition. So the idea that, that these machines 
uh, for proving theorems and Gödel, or, or, so Gödel sees these as adequately or faithfully modeling what the human computer does, the, that the activity of the machine has everything to do with us, with what we do. This was Gödel's uh, realization. And Gödel even goes further, thinking now of finite procedures in terms of Turing machine mathematical production itself, when it is finitary in a precise sense, can be offloaded to, to this machine. So the machine metaphor is, is being uh, drawn on here. And um, I, I won't, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll end here. By the iconic and the performative modes, I mean, when we learn about the Turing machine, you know, there's all the pencil and paper of it. Uh, you know, there's this sort of iconic imagery of, you know, children sitting at their desk doing their sums and so on. And on the other hand, there's this protocol-like aspect. The Turing machine is a, is a set of operations. So this iconic and performative mode within a larger framework of, uh, of, of the technological sublime. So again, a kind of pastoral um, uh, romanticized image of, in this case, the, the, the landscape, the American landscape as against uh, industrialization. Um, right? So uh, uh, this, these iconic, you know, this, this actually splits into an iconic and into the iconic and the uh, performative. So I'm just going to end. Of course, um, uh, technological optimism is is something that, uh, with with modernism itself, at least in art, this is something that we have moved uh, past. So I will just uh, remind you of Hannah Arendt. This is 1946. Talks about uh, advancements in automation enabled by the industrial revolution could result in the deadliest, most sterile passivity history has ever known. So uh, we are a long way from the technological optimism of the, of the 30s. Thank you. You've been very patient. Sorry, I've gone on so long. And this is very much a work in progress. So. Uh, well, I had a question. So why don't I see if, if, if that works? So the, the okay. question I wanted to ask is, in your Greenberg quote, you talked about the this idea of a of a, a subject using its characteristic methods to criticize itself, and I wondered it was pretty clear that you had in mind logic fair as a means of of math of of doing this for mathematics. But how did first of all, I didn't really see how that could understand uh, be, or be applied to the arts themselves, and in particular, not so much to the discursive arts like literature, but rather to the visual arts or even to music. So that's that would be the the first thing I wanted to know a little bit more about. Which I'm sure that's clear if you, if you've read Greenberg. But then the second idea I wanted to ask about. So I'll I'll let you. Well, why don't you go ahead and respond to that, and then I'll I'll say my second thing. So so the sort of I mean painting with a broad brush. We have um, you know with the emergence of the foundational programs, uh, starting with uh, Frege. I mean, one could argue that they start they start well before. Um, mathematics enters into this kind of self-critical mode, right? We use, I mean, this is, has uh, a very complete form in Hilbert with proof theory, right? So the idea is we turn mathematical methods, we use mathematical methods to study our proofs, to study mathematics it, itself. So this is what I meant by, and the parallel, the parallelism here is um, in the Greenberg analysis, I mean, he sees this kind of self-criticism uh, of a practice, this kind of self-critical mode in the case of painting, he sees this as the essence of, of modernism. Um, now, I think the problem with this kind of criticism and the difficulty of it is that, um, you know, people want a mechanism. They want, <laughs> they they want more, right? I mean, is is uh, you know, sure, these things are happening at the same time, but um, you know, what other reason is there to think that they have anything, anything to do with each other? Um, and yeah, that's 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 the difficulty. So I'm not I'm not claiming a mechanism here. I'm just simply pointing out that both art and mathematics 
enter in, in very specific ways, enter into the self-critical mode or self-reflective mode. With Hilbert, you can think of all foundational programs like this, but certainly with Hilbert, the development of proof theory and in modernism, uh, this story that Greenberg tells about you know, something very, very important, and that is the suppression of realism and um, representationalism in painting and the onset of, uh, of, of abstraction, which reaches a kind of apotheosis um, and, and uh, uh, a position of autonomy and purity in the 1940s and 1950s when uh, these, these works are, uh, you know, even entering the body on the basis of, and this was the catchphrase, eyesight alone, right? So the viewer becomes not a, a historicized viewer or a, a viewer, um, you know, who is moved uh, emotionally by, you know, memory or something like that, becomes a, a, a viewer affected by color, texture, flatness, and that it's, it's, this was Greenberg's point of view. Yeah, I'll just uh, let me then ask the other part of my question. So if I wanted, I, I wanted to push that more because I think that it's interesting to think about the analogy with mathematics, but not so much thinking of logic or so-called foundations as the subject that could provide a criticism of itself, but to think of if 20th century mathematics in, its, in itself, independently of these foundational projects, could provide a parallel to the kind of criticism that the arts can bring to themselves. So one thinks here naturally of someone like what Bourbaki was trying to do, or even with what algebraic geometers have been trying to do in trying to press the, the subject itself in, in thinking about how we represent the, the, uh, the objects under study, we limit the objects under study, we, uh, well, yeah. starting with just those, thinking about that without, because in a sense, the, it feels heavy handed to talk about logic doing a criticism of itself. Not heavy handed, it's it's not wrong, but but the point is even more interesting if, if somehow the mathematicians who are not doing it for the sake of, of foundational projects were also doing something of the modernist bent as well in a way that contrasts with what, say, an 18th century or a 19th century mathematician might have been doing. I don't know, that's... Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think I'm not so much talking about logic here. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to build, um, I'm trying to build my story around this single episode of Gödel's confrontation with the Turing machine and thinking about the power of the machine metaphor um, on a subjectivity, if you like, uh, like like Gödel's, I think uh, certainly taking the notion of proof as an object of mathematical study. I mean, I think to me this is a this is a very clear use of or employment of the self-critical mode. But yeah, I'm sure um, I'm sure there's a lot to be said about and a lot more interesting things to be said about self-critical modes in, in algebraic geometry. I mean, here, you know, we are characterizing the de de definable sets um, along, along certain, uh, you know, along, using a very sort of strict methodology and seeing that as a kind of self-critical mode. I think that's, that's interesting, sure. Okay, thanks. So I see that Andre has his hand up. So Andre, please go ahead. I cannot hear Andre. No, I can't hear you, Andre. I think Andre is muted. Andre, you can maybe type your, sure. your question. Are you muted, Andre? He seems. It is that he is not muted, but we cannot hear him. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I have to say, so as I say, I, I this is the first time I've ever read a paper, I think, in a talk or on on Zoom. So, um, uh, 
you know, I, I, I had to struggle with skipping over sections and, and so on. And this is a very, um, you know, this is a very experimental uh, 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 paper. Um, it's something I've been I've been thinking about for a long time, but um, you know, certainly very open. As I said, you know, this this issue of of mechanism, you know, how exactly does that happen? I take a very light approach to that. I don't I don't think. Um, I mean, for me, the parallelism is 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 enough, really. Um, anything more you want to say? Okay, I wonder if Gödel's suggestion uh, to define the notion of formal system is not too too restrictive. Well, um, we do see a formalism, Andre, as far as I, I I understand. I mean, we do we are living now with a syntactic syntax semantics distinction, right? We we take that distinction for granted and we we see, I, I mean, now instead of talking about the formalism, we talk about the syntactic, you know, the syntactic part of the analysis. So I think that um, that notion, I, yeah, I mean, using the Turing machine is, is very criticized nowadays. I mean, it's, it's resource and sensitive. So I think a number of people have said you know, you have computations that will halt, you know, well after the billions of years or trillions of years it takes for the sun to hit the earth. So in what way is this some kind of adequate modeling? There's no uh, attention paid to, to resource. Okay, I see, Se I see Seb Sebastian Gandon has a, has a question. Hello. Yes. Hi, Hello. Seb. Um, I have a question about, um, I have two questions, in fact. Uh, one question and one suggestion. The, the question is about what is intrinsically uh, uh, clarifying in this uh, Turing machine model? Uh, that is what, what I, I want. I have the impression that um, before Turing, you have many definition of calculability and uh, with Turing you have a, a new new model which is a machine model and which unify all this different kind of uh, conception and that your 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 answer your your you, you wonder why why did Turing achieve this kind of unification and you 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 relate this power, powerful unification with the fact that it's a it's a machine, it, but what? Um, my, my question is: uh, Is this uh, machine model something that is uh, very extraneous from the other kind of uh, approach? That is, um, my 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 question is about. Uh, I have the impression that. Um, that you want to locate the, the the origin of this unification, and that you you and I I, I, I see two two options. There is one option which is okay. This is a this is a non-language dependent thing because it is a machine. Yeah. But you have a second option which is uh, it is a machine, and it it's a more positive answer. What what in this notion of machine explain that uh, Turing achieve what he achieved to do, uh, and I, I, I don't know exactly where you where, where you stand. Sorry for my question, which is no, 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 uh, it's a perfect not, uh, com which is confused. But I have the impression that you you hesitate between two options, and that uh, well, I think, and and we have to talk about. Um, we have to talk about the post systems also. Mm. I mean, I think when when I teach my students in, in computability, I teach them about the post systems or about the Turing machine. There's a delight that you have um, that you don't have when you learn about uh, when you when you learn the, the the modelings of the notion of computability in terms of computability and a logic. So you give a Hilbert style proof. Um, 
right? So, so the idea is whenever you have a function like the exponential function, two to the x equals y means that there's a formal theory and you can prove within that theory, the formal analog of that, of that statement. And so in the 1930s, and this is in, this is something that I've written about a lot, this idea that there's a split between, I mean, the, the first notion of computability that was, that was uh, written in, uh, I, I mean, one of the first Church's, Church's Lambda calculus done logically was inconsistent, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think the whole notion of computability in a logic is kind of circular, right? Because you say a function is computable in a logic, not just any logic, a logic whose proof predicate is given effectively. Okay, well, you need to analyze the notion of effectivity that you're attaching to that formal system. You need a further formal system in order to understand that notion. And you're just involved in this infinite. So, so I think the logical conception, which, you know, Kri Kripke wrote about one of his last papers, the logical conception is very problematic. Um, so what you have in the 30s with Church and, and others, they start to develop this algorithmic conception of computability based on, um, you know, iteration and, and application of certain rules and so on. And the Turing machine um, is, is a kind of beautiful formulation of, of, of that. So I think this sort of the sort of joy of the of the thing is is um, is undoubtedly is undoubtedly there, and I think the the Turing machine is sort of surrounded. I mean, when you look at the iconography of it, mm -hmm. you know, it's always you always see pencil and paper and reference to children and so on, and what I call this kind of mathematical pastoral. Um, so so uh, not to mention, of course, I mean, the whole reason, I mean, look at what we have today, automatic theorem proving. You know, why are we doing that? Because we think that there might be proofs that are so difficult that will, you know, involve, you know, checking of many cases that we'll never be able to find them. But if the machine does it, <laughs> it's going mm -hmm. to be right. So, so you know, machines are, are very, very reliable. If we can offload and this is, of course, a big conversation. But you know, how much of mathematics are we supposed to be offloading to these to okay. these machines, and and is the whole thing even possible? So um, again, I think uh, I think the Turing machine is undoubtedly uh, appealing. I mean, just 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 what it is, but it's also what I'm trying to sketch uh, is the kind of broader cultural con context mm. of modernism. And this idea of the machine metaphor, right? I mean, the machine as a body, we think of the machine as a body, we think of the body as a machine. I mean, this is a metaphor that we've been living with since probably Aristotle, I think, when it's a very powerful metaphor and it worked, and metaphors work very powerfully on, on a scientific discourse. So, um, but I, I think, so the question, the question that I wanted to to think about is this, uh, you know, these very kind of radical statements of Gödel about the Turing machine and about it being the only full of a phenomenologically worked out um, notion. Uh, you know, this was, this was very characteristic of him to 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 have such a drastic um, change of change of mind. Um, started to think about technological optimism and found Carolyn Jones's work. Okay, thank I don't you. Know if that helps. Okay, how do the? Yeah, yeah. So, so the problem of cultural influence. Um, I realized as I was. Uh, that I called this talk the problem of cultural cultural influence, but actually I'm I'm talking more about this idea of symbiosis or harmonization, right? Um, I mean, if you look at the art critical literature on modernism, there's this very powerful. It's it's indexed in a very powerful way to the machine. Um, 
so um, uh, um, I think uh, whether this pours into the group working on computability in the 1930s or whether it, it, it migrates from them to, I mean, the futurists certainly, you know, they, they, were, they were much earlier, this kind of, you know, machine aesthetic and the worship of the machine and so on. I mean, this was around before, before well before the 19, 1930s, in fact, thinking of Walt Whitman in the 19th century, writing poems about, you know, uh, the Suez Canal and how, how great it was. Um, so I, I think that, um, so you ask, how did the achievements of Gödel in turn contribute or modify or change notion of autonomy and thereby our understanding of modernism? I think that um, what you see, I, I'm not sure that Greenberg knew about the Hilbert program, that's, that's a question, or knew about the foundational programs. Certainly the artists of the 1960s, they know all about self-reference and Gödel's theorem and so on. And they, they, they draw on those, um, they draw on those concepts in, 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 in their work. Um, so I think that's a, that's a very big, that's a very big uh, question. Um, just, just a question about autonomy. Um, you know, I mean, the idea is that I think in, in Greenberg's view, painting reaches a kind of apio apotheosis, a kind of endpoint in its development, and then the thing collapses. So in the 1960s, you have, you know, a completely different, um, you have minimalism, you have, you know, later on, you have conceptual art, you have, you know, performance, uh, you know, modernism just overnight seems to, seems to go, that is to say, late modernist uh, uh, art. So somehow there's some kind of trajectory of collapse, which is, which is built into autonomy. I think autonomy in mathematics, I mean, if you look at the proof theorists, they would say that, um, you know, their, their picture of mathematics as, you know, or as the sort of correct way to go in terms of a foundational system, just getting rid of syntax altogether, uh, sorry, semantics, the elimination of syntax, I think that is uh, a position that can be, can be described in, in terms, in the language of autonomy, for sure. Um, that's the best I can do with your question. Timur, I think we, we corresponded, right, about um, the Entscheidungsproblem and, and so on. Yes, thank you very much for uh, your answer. And uh, yes, well, it's uh, eliminated for me. Thank you very much. And yes, we did correspond. Yeah, with, uh, yeah. Everybody. That's yes. one nice thing about Zoom is that you can, you can actually you make a lot of new friends. <laughs> but uh, as I say, this is very, um, you know, this is, this is very much uh, a kind of last paper of mine on, on computability. I was very fascinated by Gödel's 1946 uh, Princeton Bicentennial Lecture. And it's kind of drove me back to where he talks about computability as, as uh, being kind of, um, perfectly worked out uh, answer to the epis to the adequacy question um, for computability and then says we should do the same thing we should do what Turing did for computability uh, for provability and definability and so um, that's something I've been working on a lot the sort of implementation of that suggestion and um, and um, but part of the story is certainly the computability story in the 30s and why good old, uh, or at least, you know, how is it? Now you can say, you know, this was rather convenient <laughs> to say, well, now we know what a finite procedure is. We know what a formal system is. And he made this famous remark to somebody, jetzt mengen lehrer, now, now, now it's time for set theory. So, um, 
you know, if you're uncharitable, you can say, well, he just he just didn't want to think about these things anymore, instead of seeing this as a kind of grand solution. Okay, anybody else? If not, then let's uh, thank you, Juliet, for for doing this, and uh, I think we can we can close for the night. So, thank you. So thank you, and uh, talk to you soon, Juliet. Talk bye. to you soon. Okay. Bye bye.